I'm going to read a bit from Motherland and a little bit from Dirt Road Home. But I want to talk about how Motherland came to be because it was um, initially um, conceived as an unhistory. We don't have anything um, really called history. What we have are stories, and our stories are usually organized around places. So I'm going to take you sort of through an unhistory um, of the Northeast, of the Dawnland, um, but there will also be historical components um, uh, sort of throughout that. But I didn't want to do it simply as, well, here's the old stories and here's like colonialism because it like privileges somehow that moment of invasion as like, a, you know, a, a, the defining um, happening for us. And it is emphatically not. So I want to start um, actually with some poems from Dirt Road Home. Um, part of the amazing work that Lisa Brooks has been doing um, is reclaiming um, the Northeast as native space, um, really you know, uh, asserting that this is native space and has always been native space. And one of the things that um, I always I want to thank my father for is making me know that, um, not by telling me that, but by helping me to see in a particular way. This is called trees. You taught me the land so well that all through my childhood, I never saw the highway, the truck stops, the lumber yards, the asphalt works, but instead saw the hills, the trees, the ponds on the south end of Quinsigamond that twined through the tangled underbrush where old cars rusted back to earth and rubber tires made homes for fish. Driving down the dirt road home, it was the trees you saw first, all New England of forest. I have seen you get out of a car, breathe in the sky, the green of summer maples, listen for the talk of birds and squirrels, the murmur of earthworms beneath your feet. When you looked toward the house, you had to shift focus as if it were something difficult to see. Trees filled the yard until Ma complained, where is the sun? Now you are gone, she is cutting them down to fill the front with azaleas. The white birch you loved, we love. Its daughters are filling the back. Your grandchildren play among them. We have taught them as you taught us to leave the peeling bark, to lean their cheeks against the powdery white and hear the heartbeat of the tree. Sacred, beautiful, companion. So there was this way of um, of perceiving the world around you where, where the land is primary. Everything else is secondary and can easily be, be gone. Um, and if you have been around here for any uh, length of time, you know just how easily that can happen. If you don't mow the grass for a year, your yard starts turning back to forest. It doesn't take very long. So I want to read a few poems that come from the place where I grew up, um, which is uh, Quinn Sigmund. And when I've, I, I realized after having read some of these poems um, for years that people were picturing me on like some like distant like um, island um, in the wilderness. Um, actually, where I grew up is between Worcester and Shrewsbury, Massachusetts, on a little tiny island at the south end, heavily populated, um, but nevertheless surrounded by water, and so in some way defined by that. Um, so when I, w I had moved all the way from the island into Worcester and was um, in a poetry workshop, and someone in the workshop said, you're always writing about the land. Why, you know, you're living in the city. Why don't you write a city poem? So I went home with the idea that I was going to write a city poem. And this is what I wrote. It's called Bones, a city poem. Forget the great blue heron flying low over the marsh, its footprints still fresh in the sand. Forget the taste of wild mushrooms and where to find them. Forget lichen-covered pines and Iceland moss. Forget the one-legged duck and the eggs of the snapping turtle laid in the bank. Forget the frog found in the belly of the bass. Forget the cove testing its breath against the autumn morning. 
Forget the down-filled nest and the snake swimming at midday. Forget the bullhead lilies and the whiskers of the pout. Forget walking on black ice beneath the sky hunter's bow. Forget the living waters of quinsigamond. Forget how to find the pole star and why. Forget the eyes of the red fox, the hornets that made their home in the skull of a cow. Forget waking to hear the call of the loon. Forget that raccoons are younger brothers to the bear. Forget that you are walking on the bones of your grandmothers. So, <clears throat> so I want to start, uh, start with the, well, I already started. I want to read some poems that are kind of from deep time. Um, and this um, book, Motherland, turned out not to just be an unhistory. It was going to be Northeast on Turtle Island, an unhistory. But then I wrote all these poems about my mother, which were going to be called Gem Songs. Um, and then uh, at some point, they came together and they became Motherland. So I want to read actually uh, a creation story from, from each of those. The first one is First Diamond. And one of the things that happened, those of you who've already read the book, uh, realized that a lot of the poems make shapes on the page. Um, I was really contemptuous of that. It's called concrete poetry, you know, making a picture on the page with words. Um, when, I was a, when I first saw a concrete poem in probably seventh or eighth grade, it was this poem some of you may have seen. It's like an apple. And it says apple, 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 apple. And at the very bottom it says worm. And I thought, joke, but not poem. So I always stayed away from doing that. But in this book, um, there are a number of, of poems that actually took shape. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about this one. But this is a diamond. First diamond. This is the place where time slows down, where light is collected and flashes in all the colors of love. It is the eternal place where she meets him in the heat of desire and the pressure of clasped bodies. Here, they turn the opaque dark into radiant seed. And this one is first woman. I'm going to read it, and I want to talk about it a little bit. <clears throat> First woman, it is because she feels like this, sun on morning dew, a drop of water on her heel, white butter gritty against the teeth like corn in August, roasted in sea salt and sand. So we have this fragment of a story that basically says that the, that first woman was created from, from dew, morning dew on a, a leaf in the sunshine, sparkling in the sunshine. And it's at her heel. We're told it's at her heel. And I was thinking about this um, and how profound it is, um, how it means that the ancestors paid so much attention to where life came from. It's really easy to say um, all life on the planet basically depends on green plants. Um, so I can see from all your faces that you're like really impressed. <laughs> but, but that is a reality. And somehow the ancestors knew that. Um, and they also knew that, you know, what is it that makes pl green plants grow? They need sunshine and they need water. Um, obviously not knowing about carbon dioxide and so forth at that time. And so the story is that this is where First Woman came from. And not just where she came from a green plant, but from that very moment, from that very moment where sun and dew and the green leaf comes together. And she, it is at her heel. She leaps forward into life. So within that story that comes directly out of the land, there's a sort of mythopoetic power um, that you know, sort of blows me away, that it's just like this tiny, tiny little story, and yet it's all in there. <clears throat> so I want to tell another story. Um, we have this character, Gluskabi, um, and Gluskabi uh, is, I, I guess, a trickster figure. Um, he's a spirit person. He, he does a lot of silly things that 
put the world out of balance and then he has to put them back into balance again. Um, but he also like matures and eventually is the one responsible for creating human beings in most of our stories. So um, this is a story uh, called Game Bag. Grandmother Woodchuck. This, grandmother, uh, this grandson of mine always has a better idea. Why not capture all the animals in one huge bag, he thinks to himself. Why not tie up the eagle who creates the wind? And no sooner does he think it than he does it. Still, that is the way he learns. Someday he will grow up. People will speak well of him. Doesn't he always listen to his grandmother in the end? I want to stop here and say something I forgot to say, which is, um, when I was in fifth grade, <clears throat> I had a teacher who told us with great glee that the Mayans had wheels, but they only had them on toys, and that it never occurred to them to use them in like, you know, a cart or something big. And I raised my hand and said, well, maybe they decided not to. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, maybe they like, you know, thought about what a wheel would, you know, possibly mean, and they decided not to use it. And his answer was that they couldn't do that, that progress was its own imperative. And um, so then eventually I heard this story. Grandmother Woodchuck pulls the hair from her belly, from the tender place. Each pull stings, but she will do this for the grandson who, bought, who will bring tobacco back for her in her old age. She weaves the hair into a game bag, one that will stretch big enough to hold all the animals in the world. It is a woman's strength that will hold them, and a woman's strength that will set them free. So Gluskambi has requested a game bag from his grandmother, not just any game bag. She makes him game bags out of several different kinds of fur. And he says, no, grandmother, that's not the right one. He throws them on the floor. And finally, she says, what kind of game bag do you want? And he says, oh, grandmother, I want one made of woodchuck hair. And so she pulls the tender hair from her belly, and she creates a bag for him. And it's a magic bag. And it's just the kind of bag he wants because he wants to be able to get all those animals to go into it. Inside, we are a million eyes open in the dark. We are chipmunk and mole, rabbit and squirrel. We are musk and fur and claw and feathers. We are fox, raccoon, mink and fisher. We are chickadees, blue jays, owls and turkeys. We are hooves and hide, deer and elk, moose and caribou, lynx and bear, cougar and wolf. We are all listening in the dark for the sound of the world ending. In the conversation. So he brings the game bag back to Grandmother Woodchuck and says, look, this is such a great idea. All the animals are in here. And uh, all we have to do is reach in and get one. And she explains to him all the reasons why that's not a good idea. Um, where are they going to get sun and water? Who's going to clean that? Like, what, what happens when they're all gone? You know, what are our grandchildren going to eat? So this is the conversation. Why are you always doing things like this? It seemed like a good idea at the time. The world is restored. When he finally let us out, I thought there'd be nothing left, but here it is, just as before, only more beautiful. Trees, air, water, and the sound of all of us breathing in the dark woods. I want to move to the Connecticut River Valley. Um, have any of you ever been up to the Amherst, Northampton area, that area of the Connecticut River Valley? Uh, UMass is up there, um, Amherst College. So if you're up there, you'll notice that you're in a big basin. You can see uh, to the south uh, the Holyoke Range, which goes east and west. It's the only mountain range in the, in the east that does that. Um, and if you look north from that, you can see the Great Beaver. If you're going up Route 116, you can see the head, body, and tail of the Great Beaver. So this is called at Sugarloaf, 1996, Kitsiamisqua. 
In the big pond, Kitsiamisqua, the beaver, is swimming. He has built a dam. The water in his pond grows deeper. He patrols the edges, chasing everyone away. This is all mine, he says. The people and animals grow thirsty. Cut it out, creator says, and turns Kitsiamisqua to stone. The pond is drained. There is water and food for everyone. See those hills, Kitsiamisqua's head, body, and tail? He's lying there still, this valley, his empty pond. Two, Kitsiamisqua dreams. For living out of balance, Kitsiamisqua lies still, while for centuries his descendants are trapped in every stream, caught in every river, killed by the millions for fur lust from across the sea. They're pelts by blankets, cloth, weapons, knives. In this world out of balance, Kitsiamisqua dreams a hard dream, a world without beavers. Then, far away, like the promise of a winter dawn, he dreams the rivers back, young mothers building, secure in their skins, and a pond full of the slapping tails of children. So if we come to the present time, or actually it's not present time anymore, it's 20 years ago, time flies when you're having fun. Um, this is another story from that same place. Um, it's actually during the time when I discovered that story, which had been sleeping for such a long time. Two, two of us um, were in the valley at the same time, two, two Abenaki women in the valley at the same time, and we both came across this story. It was a story clearly that wanted to awaken. Um, and it was during this uh, time that I was a student there. Um, this is called graduate school first semester, so here I am writing about Indians again. It starts, uh, with a quote from Winona LaDuke, the conquest is not sustainable. Thanks for bringing that to our attention, she said the first time, to my response to a history text about a famous painting of the Battle of Quebec that never mentioned the French and only mentioned Indians twice, once as nuisances, once as the noble savage kneeling by the dying English general. This was during the French and Indian War, I said. Soon thousands of French and Indian people would be displaced, sold into indentured servitude, my own family among them. There would be bounties on the heads of Abenaki people in Maine, and the English would sow the fields of the Mohawks with salt. Thanks for bringing that up, she said. The next book mentioned cannibals in the Caribbean, Indians who believed the Spanish were gods, Indians killing themselves, Indian women in love with Spanish pricks, Indians whose names, even when known, were passed over in favor of the ones given them by the Spanish. Stop writing about Indians, she told me. You're making everyone feel guilty. But the next book was back in Maine, home territory, the diary of a midwife, right after that same French and Indian war. And she was using herbs not found in English herbals and wrote that a young squaw visited her over a period of five we three weeks. But the famous historian said only that there may have been Indians in the area, while she wrote at length about white men dressing up as Indians to protest against the rich stealing their lands. Stop writing about Indians, she told me again, only louder, as if I was hard of hearing. You have to allow authors their subjects, she said. Stop writing about what isn't in the text, which is just our entire history. This week, she said, I'm really upset. You're telling the same story three times because there's only one story about Indians and we all know what it is. So I asked her if there are an infinite number of stories about white people and she told me to stop being racist. So I stayed away from class for a week because they were reading a book about a mystery in the Everglades and I knew there had to be Indians in that swamp and I didn't want to have to write about Indians again. 
It was on to the next book, written, she said, by a Cherokee writer, which Leslie Silco, who was Laguna, will be interested to find out, because the book was Ceremony. But that is a small mistake, sort of like saying that Dante is Chinese, so I overlooked it. Now, she told me, write about Indians. And I might have done that, except she went on about Indians putting on a mask of whiteness, like white people put on blackface. And some of the students wrote it down in their notebooks, and everyone started talking about minstrel shows. Then she wanted me to tell her if there is such a thing as an Indian worldview. And I said, well, yes and no, which I figured was safe, since I would be at least half right whichever answer she wanted. But when I mentioned the European worldview, she said there isn't any such thing, which was quite a relief to me. I hate to think there are a whole lot of people thinking in hierarchies and as if the earth is a dead object, and animals and plants, and some people not having spirit. Then she said I'd better stick to what I know, that is, Indians, which is what I was trying to do in the first place, and that maybe European philosophy was too much for my primitive brain, in spite of its being my undergraduate major. And I pointed out that the oppressed always know more about the oppressor than vice versa. So she just glared at me and told me that I look Scandinavian, which was a surprise to me. And I wondered why I never was a prom queen, since it was always the Scandinavian girls who got that honor. Maybe they never noticed I was one of them. Exactly how much Indian are you anyway, she asked. I told her I guessed I was pretty much Indian. I suppose she wondered why I wouldn't accept that mask of whiteness she kept talking about as myself. You know, I always think that if I put these little um, note, note things, I will find, I will know what I'm doing. <laughs> but. So the other thing that you probably know about the, um, the Connecticut River Valley in that area is um, Northampton. Um, and so uh, I want to write, I want to read a couple of poems that uh, have to do with being there and being in Northampton. The first is, You Bring Out the Butch in Me. It's for Diane. I want to lift weights, display my arms, throw out underwires and wear a white rib tank t-shirt. I want to carry a wrench, drive a truck, cover you with roses. I want to order artichokes and lemon and watch the olive oil darken your lips. I want to wear a velvet jacket and I, the heart-shaped ruby pendant, nestle between your breasts. I want to look at you, look at you, look at you. I want to know you in the biblical sense. I want to watch you put on lipstick. I want to open doors, do all the driving, walk on the outside of sidewalks. I want to wear leather, strut in Doc Martens, twirl you around a dance floor. I want you to know when I love you that you've been loved. So Northampton is this kind of lesbian haven, um, but even so, um, with my first love affair, um, there's that thing about being public um, that still was, didn't feel safe, even in Northampton. This is called Deep Winter, and it was a deep winter. This was a winter of much snow. I wanted to kiss your neck in the middle of traffic, but instead I just brushed your cheek. We'd been eating Greek food, avgolemino, moussaka, hot flatbreads with olive oil and feta. I wanted to kiss you then in falling snow, Bring on an early thaw. <clears throat> so this is one of these um, these poems that uh, turned into a picture on the page. Um, it's called Red. Those of you who have already read this, um, but if you haven't, I will just do the teacher thing and show you that it's basically a maple tree on the page. Um, it wanted to be a maple tree. I wrote it as I wrote all my poems initially, left justified, and it didn't look very good, so I centered it. 
and it was a tree. And with only a few tiny tweaks, it became this poem. So there's a few things I want to say about it. First, I want to say that our creation stories tell us that, that we were created from the trees, Abenaki people, excuse me, were created from the trees. So in a very real sense, they are our relatives, our close relatives. Um, uh, the other thing I want to say about it is it's a poem that's also in conversation. It starts with um, a poet uh, that I'm driving with um, down this backcountry road between Amherst and Worcester. We were going to a poetry reading. And it and ends up with a quote from Christos, who's a Menominee poet. So, red. In his new poem, the red autumn woods are a metaphor for leftist martyrs. We are traveling east through a maple forest that blazes the hillsides on both sides of this winding back country road. Look at the trees, I want to tell him. Listen, the trees have their own stories to tell, like the story of fire deep within the heart. They too have been martyrs in the long war against the land, a nation cut down, children denied. A hundred years ago, these hills were bare of trees, the stone walls that wind through them, the illusion of ownership. Now the hills are red with maples. My heart is leaping out to meet them. My eyes cannot be full enough. Though acid falls from the clouds, maples have gathered on the hillsides in every direction. See how they celebrate. They are wearing their brightest dresses. Come, sisters, let me dance with you. I offer you a song. Let me paint it red with passion. You are all the women I have ever loved. So let me move for a minute to uh, Cape Cod. Actually, no, before that, let me move to the Grand Banks. We'll, we'll do the ocean. Um, the Grand Banks. From the ocean's depths, from the dark place, rising up from the sea floor, this great underwater plateau, this dinner table for fish, this underwater banquet, this feasting place where haddock and cod gather like buffalo, their numbers too great to imagine. The currents hit the slopes, feeding nutrients from sea bottom, the water rich with plankton, algae, diatomic life. Whales come from the warm waters of the south to raise the young here, where food is plentiful, filling the waters with song that can be heard for a thousand miles, more. Ocean is their word for world. So what a lot of people don't realize is that colonization really started uh, on the East Coast really started out there in the Grand Banks. Um, within a, a period of 10 years, you started seeing you know, 200 ships from France and 400 ships from Britain and 600 ships from here. And there are all kinds of places that you wouldn't even think of. Um, you would think of them, well, that's an inland country. Why would they have a fleet? And yet they all ended up there in the Grand Banks. So they were extracting all these, all these fish. Um, you know, before they ever came to land, everywhere. Suddenly, they are everywhere. They circle like vultures, but they are not vultures, for they kill their prey. They circle like eagles, but they are not eagles, for they take their prey not one at a time, but by the thousands. They cast nets like spiders, but they are not spiders, for they have forgotten the strands of connection. They look like human beings, but they leave no gifts, and the songs they sing are only for themselves. So when the English uh, came to the Northeast, um, everyone thinks about um, the, the Mayflower, Plymouth Rock, but they actually landed on Cape Cod first. And um, I was reading William Cronin's uh, book on changes in the land. And there was this sentence, like this little sentence that was just a transition from one thing to another that basically said that when they, um, before they moved on to Plymouth, um, 
they saw something that looked like a grave and they dug it up. And then it went on to something else. It just went on to something else. And I was just like flabbergasted that somehow this could be something that wasn't a, a sort of a main point. It's just, you know, and so as a poet, um, I felt like we need to slow that down because this is something that didn't just happen once. Let's slow it down and take it in. Before moving on to Plymouth from Cape Cod, 1620, they find what looks like a grave, what looks like a grave, a grave, and they dig it up. They find a grave, it looks like a grave, and they dig it up. They dig it up, the grave. It looks like they dig it up, and they dig it up, and it looks like a grave, and they dig it up. I kind of wanted to write a poem. Um, I started to write a poem that was sort of like a list of things not to do if you go to a strange country. Um, you know, if you see something like, that looks like a grave, don't dig it up. Uh, when I was, my initial uh, idea for this book was that every poem would have some kind of a footnote. Um, and so I found myself like uh, just finding information in all kinds of different places. Um, and this one actually was from um, a, a book, like a field guide to edible plants. It's called Englishman's Footprint, and it does make a footprint on the page, I have to admit. <clears throat> Englishman's Footprints. Plantain makes a good tea. Its seeds are crushed and used as a laxative. It is found in every English garden. Now its leaves are pushing up everywhere. You can find it outside every English settlement, its long leaves with parallel veins, its central stalks of tiny flowers. Wherever the English go, plantain grows in their footsteps. When you see it, you'll know that they're near. That English boy found his way home following those footsteps. When you see it, go the other way. I had a great big Newfoundland dog, my favorite dog ever. And um, during the time I had him, someone uh, told me that those were our, like our, our dogs. They were called Indian bear dogs and that they've actually found them in graves that are 2,000 years old. Um, in Newfoundland, um, when they went in there and um, basically massacred people. They also massacred the dogs. And there, were, there was an English couple there who, who um, saved some of the dogs and brought them to England, and then they eventually were reintroduced. Um, but a friend of mine found a reference to a new Newfoundland uh, with Joseph Brandt, a Mohawk statesman who um, did a lot of walking around the Dawnland. And, um, it was really, I was just really happy to know that there was this dog. Newfoundland walking with Joseph Brandt. He is a good man, though like all men, he doesn't stop often enough to smell the trees and melting snow. On the island, they are all dead. The pups drowned, the old ones shot. They say some escaped in boats. I jumped into the sea, saving myself at least this time. No one knows I'm here, walking these inland woods where rabbits are plump and pups won't drown. How are we doing for time? Let me read two more poems. <clears throat> so I've been finally learning some language. And one of the first words I learned was nebi. Um, and it means water. And um, there's another word connected to nebi, which is nebi zone, which, which means medicine water. But it also means all those streams of experience that sort of flow through us. Um, and I was astonished because I wrote an entire poem to express that, and there it was in one word in our language. Um, Abenaki is a language of verbs. Um, and I was told that, for example, you wouldn't say, um, could I have a cup of coffee? You would say, coffee me. 
And so I wanted to use that construction uh, in a poem. So this is called Nebi. It starts with a quote from Poland, an Abenaki leader from 1739, who said, this is the river I belong to. We breathe the traveling clouds and drink what falls glistening from cliffs and into whirlpool basins carved in granite on its way back to sky. Water me, glisten me, carve and whirlpool me, cascade me, white water me, sing me, babble me, pool me, pond me, swamp me, bog me, trout and salmon me, frog and dragonfly me, loon and otter me. Breathe me the humid sky while leaves gather pools of summer air. Nebi, we say, uligo nebi, the water is good. So I'll move now to the White Mountains. There are two rivers there that are very important to us, and this one is uh, Pemijuacet, and I'll end with this one. Um, Pemijuacet, if any of you have been up to the Franconia State Park, um, yeah, there's, uh, on one side is the flume, which is really well known, and on the other side is the basin. And uh, the basin is like uh, been carved out of the, the Pemi over many, probably millions of years um, into this, it's just the water swishing round and round, uh, creating this bowl. But uh, before you get to that, there's just the water going, like cascading all, all over the granite rock, which are the bones. Um, we are down to the bones here in our mountains. Uh, Pemi Juasset. We are at the source, the place where the Pemi streams out of the lake over the granite in cascades and whirlpools. Tourists rush past us, two Abenaki women gazing silently into water. I feel like a ghost, she says. They can't even see us. Tourists follow the signs to the next attraction. They don't want to miss anything. Below us, around us, water is flowing. That's because they are in a state park, I say, and we are at the center of the world. The rocks are full of water. Everywhere, water is moving. Thank you.